Hey, welcome along to Tuesday's edition of the Mark Stein Show. We have a stellar lineup of stories and guests for you today, so as ever, you won't want to miss it tonight. We'll be taking a deep dive into how local taxpayers are left picking up the extortionate costs at the expense of our broken asylum system. I am calling for local referendums on migrant hotels. I'll be speaking to Windsor and Maidenhead councillor Stuart Carroll about how his local area has had to find £1 million to soak up costs incurred by the asylum programme. And according to the Fire Brigade's union, firefighters making an average salary of thirty-two grand a year have been forced to use food banks to provide for themselves. Conservative MP Brendan Smith publicly voiced his concerns with the union on this, which caused a little bit of a stir on social media, to say the least. Tonight, I'm pleased to say, ladies and gentlemen, we were debating this very issue with Conservative MP Brendan Clark-Smith himself and firefighter and trade unionist Paul Embry. That is going to kick off. And after China relaxed their COVID restrictions in early December, COVID cases have soared as 70% of Shanghai's residents are now infected. Xi Jinping has warned Western nations that if they start to impose restrictions on air passengers from China, it will take countermeasures. I think it's time to call their bluff. Cindy Yu, assistant editor and host of the Chinese Whispers podcast for The Spectator, will join me to discuss... Exactly this. Later, we'll be talking as well to a transgender religious studies teacher, yep, who will be discussing how he is working to bridge relations between the LGBT community and the religious community. Lots to talk about there, namely whether or not trans issues should be taught to kids. And as always, we'll bring you the stories that matter most. But don't forget, the most important part of the show, where you get to give me a right good pummeling. GB Views at GBNews.uk. You can ask me anything. That's right. Pummel me. That's all coming up. But first is the headlines with the wonderful Aaron Armstrong. Yeah, hello there. I'm Aaron Armstrong in the GB newsroom. The health secretary is blaming COVID, flu and the threat of strep A for the extra pressure being put on the NHS. His comments come amid mounting concern over the winter crisis, with more than a dozen NHS trusts and ambulance services declaring critical incidents over the festive period. Medical experts say up to 500 people are dying each week as a result of delays in urgent care. But Steve Barclay says the government is focused on supporting the NHS. Focusing the funding onto the operations backlogs, for example, getting more diagnostic hubs in place, getting the surgical hubs that we're rolling out, uh, getting the backlog from the pandemic reduced. That's been the key priority. That's where we've surged additional funding. But we also recognise the big pressure that we're seeing played through in terms of ambulance handover delays is largely uh, triggered by those who are fit to leave hospital but delayed in doing so. And we need to free up that bed capacity and that is often about having the right social care provision to do so. Well, rail passengers will face continued disruption for the rest of the week as a result of fresh strikes by the RMT union. Roughly half of Britain's railway lines are closed with only a fifth of services running. Many places, including most of Scotland and Wales, have no trains running at all. The Transport Secretary, Mark Harper, says the government has offered a very fair pay offer, but the RMT maintains there's been no new proposal and is accusing the government of blocking an agreement. People travelling to the UK from China will not have to self-isolate if they test positive for COVID on arrival. The government says the testing is designed to collect information in the absence of transparent coronavirus data from Chinese authorities. From Thursday, though, those flying to the UK from China will be required to show a negative COVID test before boarding the plane. And thousands of mourners in Brazil lined the streets of Santos to pay their final respects to the footballing legend Pele. His coffin, draped in a Brazilian flag, was carried on a fire truck to a private family funeral where Pele was laid to rest. Earlier in the day, some 230,000 mourners, including the country's new president, filed past Pele's open casket to pay homage to the three-time World Cup winner. Pele died last week at the age of 82 after battling colon cancer. And that is it uh, on TV, online and DAB Plus Radio. This is GB News. And now it is back to Patrick. I think it's time for a series of local referendums on whether or not you want more migrant hotels in your area. 
Last year was a record year. Just under 46,000 migrants paid people smugglers thousands of pounds to illegally enter Britain via the channel. This year, they've already started coming. Hundreds. It'll be in the thousands soon, and the cycle continues. Mark my words, there will be more migrants this year than last year. It'll be another record year. We might as well welcome the 50,000th channel migrant with a brass band, a red carpet and a night at the Ritz, like some kind of competition winner. Of course, that's not a million miles away from what they're getting anyway. But this is why we need local referendums on migrant hotels, because the local taxpayer needs to know the truth about how much it's costing their council and the burden these hotels put on resources. If the local population decide that they still want hotels in their area, fine, they can have them. But areas who say no shouldn't be made to bear the brunt. I'm going to use the Royal Borough of Windsor and Maidenhead as an example. The local council has had to find around £1 million and counting for unaccompanied children. So that's roughly a 1.25% council tax increase or a £1 million reduction in services for the local area. For the indigenous population, local residents... It impacts them. 225 refugees apparently now attend the local area's schools, which means there's a shortage of Year 5 places. Increased transport costs to get some of those kids to school, that's around 59 grand a year. There have been 50 health drop-in surgeries at the area's two Margaret hotels since April. Each comprises between one and three members of staff in order to do that. What is more difficult to quantify, of course, is the loss of revenue to the local area. The hotels that these migrants are in brought business, tourism, custom, money. Now they don't. They had gyms, leisure facilities, memberships, money. Now they don't. People worked at these hotels. Now they don't. Social housing stock was already in short supply. Now that's being used up. And any financial help the Home Office or government does offer gets a lot smaller once these migrants turn 18. Now, the Royal Borough of Windsor and Maidenhead will have to look after around 19 unaccompanied children who apparently turn 18 in the coming year. Well, then there's the impact on house prices as well. Nobody in their right minds can tell me that a migrant hotel popping up next to your home makes your property go up in value. And general security. A lot of the hotels in the country are near primary schools, nursery schools, etc. Introducing a load of young men with allegedly troubled pass onto a footpath where young girls walk to school every single morning isn't adding to a sense of ease in the local area, is it? This will be happening in your area. Do you want that? Do you want to pay 1.25% more council tax on top of the usual council tax increases? Do you want a £1 million reduction in your local public services? Do you want there to be fewer school places for your child or less social housing? Enough is enough now. The costs are astronomical, and I think you should have a vote on it. Local people have a right to know the amount of money that it is costing their council, and in turn costing them every single year to have migrant hotels. Local people have a right to know the burden that these people are having on public services, on school places, on housing, on the healthcare system. And they have a right to vote on it. There are all these lovey-dovey, bleeding-heart liberals who think everyone coming across the channel is a genuine asylum seeker. Fine. Have a vote on it. Those areas that vote in favour of migrant hotels can pay for them. The rest of the population should not have to. With me now to discuss this and go into a lot more detail, frankly, a deep dive into the local area and provide, crucially, and this is important, some solutions, is Cabinet Member for Children's Services, Education and Health in Windsor and Maidenhead Council. It's Stuart Carroll. Stuart, thank you very much. I've outlined some areas that your local council has had issues with and I think that's going to be reflected right across the board. But you, crucially, have got some solutions, have you not? Five-point plan. I have indeed, Patrick. Good evening. Good evening to your viewers. Uh, you're quite right to put it in the context that you have in terms of the level of pressure and the resource burden that that is placing on local authorities like the one of which I'm a member. But myself and the council leader, Councillor Andrew Johnson, have come forward with a five-point plan. We published this on Conservative Home a few weeks ago. And let me just quickly take you through that. The first is very much speaking to what you were just referring to in terms of getting local people involved. We need to have a local funding formula that government introduces, which isn't just the direct cost from taking a asylum seeker or a refugee, but accounts for the downstream costs, all the costs you were just listing, but also a local forum 
where we can have the four C's. That's got to be cooperation, collaboration, coordination, and cru crucially, consent. Without consent, that is going to continue to cause dismay amongst the local population. And that's not what we want at all. Secondly, and I'm pleased to see that the Prime Minister's moved on this, I, I think we have to have a dedicated border control unit. The Home Office is a basket case of the department, in my opinion. Many years ago, the former Home Secretary, John Reid, described it as not being fit for purpose. I don't think it's improved at all in recent times. I think it's badly lacking match fitness. Mm. And a bit like we did with the Vaccines Task Force, of which I was a member of, I think we need to actually take this out of the Home Office with proper leadership, external expertise and focus. Third area, international dialogue. Yes, good again to see the Prime Minister engaging with France, but we can't just have entente cordiale here where we give more money to France, we seemingly have people patrolling with the French, but then no legal enforcement. What we need to do is that if there are individuals crossing the channel, and it's a, it's a perilous, horrid reality for anybody to, to do that, and they have come directly from France, we need to have an agreement with France that we will then take those people directly back, not just mm. to pay to patrol, but once exactly. they're with us, and they've been checked for health reasons exactly. they're taken back. Quickly, border patrols. Clearly, we need to uh, invest more in border patrols and utilize the Royal Navy as appropriate. Um, and finally, as we heard on your program yesterday, Tony Smith, the former Director General of the Border Force, and he clearly knows a thing or two about this, and this is very much in line with our fifth proposal. We need to have proper processing centers and accommodation units. Um, if needed, we need to look at repurposing public assets close to the border or looking at mobile units. We can't continue this policy of dumping in hotels. It, it's, yeah. not, it's not fair yeah. on the asylum seeker, the refugee. It's mm. often coming from a very traumatised background. It's not fair on the local population. No, exactly that. And in your area right now, a couple of pretty major hotels are facing up to the reality that now the people who used to work in them have not got jobs. People in the local area have got a lot of these people who they don't know exactly who they are or where they're from to contend with. There's a massive burden, as I've outlined, to public services and local services. And it's people like you who are at the cold phase of this. And people like you, frankly, who may well have to suffer wrongly, by the way, because you had no say in this, at the ballot box at the next election, whether it's a local election or indeed in your area. By the way, it's worth pointing out the local MP there is Theresa May. I, last time I checked, she'd reign relatively quiet. Meanwhile, though, Stuart, the Home Office Mandarin, who decided that all of this was a good idea, who presided over what can only be described as an absolute show over this, well, he's got a knighthood, hasn't he? Which is remarkable. I think it's absolutely staggering. It's uh, deeply confusing and profoundly perplexing how someone can be rewarded and honoured for overseeing the type of situation as described. I mean, that would be a bit like a football manager who's overseeing the relegation of their team winning manager of the year. I think the likes of Pep Guardiola and Arteta, and I'd like to put Eddie Howe, my manager of my team, Newcastle in the mix there, would be jumping up and down saying, what, what's going on? And this is much more serious than football. This is about our sovereignty, it's about defence of the realm, it's about control of the border and all of the things that you've just described. What is clear with the honour system, by the way, is that it needs to be reformed. Um, mm -hmm. It is a black box at the moment, it's intransparent. When someone gets an honour, what needs to happen is we need to publish the criteria by which they've been given an honour and who mm -hmm. actually nominated them, because there well, is privilege and access What, can, what, can, what on earth can this guy's quite, quite this guy's a theory of yeah, what on earth can this guy's criteria be? Matthew Rycroft, Sir Matthew Rycroft, right? So he's going to end up with this criteria of, well, did you absolutely knacker local areas up and down the country? Did you manage to cost people their jobs? Did you manage to put an extra burden on social housing? Did you manage to put an extra burden on just social care in general? Did you do a lot to knock down house prices? All of this stuff. I mean, it's hardly a winner, is it? Look, Stuart, can I ask you, do you think if there was a referendum in the local area, in the Royal Borough of Windsor and Maidenhead, and it was made even obvious, even more obvious to people, uh, the exact cost. So they were, they were given a straight choice between do you want to continue down this particular path now with the migrant hotels and have a 1.25% increase to your council tax slash a million pound funding cut to your local budget? Which way do you think they'd vote on that? I think people clearly would not be in favour of uh, the situation as it is. When I speak to people, look, people are kind-hearted and kind-spirited overwhelmingly. They want to play their role. We have a proud heritage as a country in giving genuine asylum seekers refuge, and we should continue to do that. 
that is the right thing for the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland to do. But it has to be done in a way that's secure, that's controlled, and that has proper, robust processes. We cannot have a situation where we can't control the border, and then when we are seeking to process people, we dump them in local hotels. That is unacceptable. It's not sustainable. And quite rightly, local people want to see that reformed. It's why the government has got to put this very top of its list in 2023. I know there's a lot going on. I appreciate that. But remember, people voted for Brexit. And one of the arguments around Brexit was control borders, control the law of the land. Exactly. And we need to see that pull through. And we're all skin. And people are feeling the pinch as well. And this is only adding to it. And again, people have a right to vote on this, in my view. Thank you very much. I was Cabinet Member for Children's Services, Education and Health on Windsor and Maidenhead Council. That's Stuart Carroll. Look, people, get your views coming in. GBviews at gbnews.uk. I think enough is enough now. And it's time for local referendums on migrant hotels. People can put their money where their mouth is. If you want to have a big refugees welcome, sign absolutely. If you think that absolutely everything Every single Tom, Dick and Harry who's coming across the channel is a genuine asylum seeker. Be my guest. You, in your local area, can pay for the brunt of these council hotels. Because actually what we're seeing now, frankly, is around a million quid. That's just one area. And that'll be happening in your area. And when it's all laid bare and your kid can't get a place in school and all of that stuff, do you really still stand in favour of it? I'm not sure. GBviews at gbnews.uk. And it's how clandestine it is as well. Why is it the Home Office isn't telling the local areas before they plonk a migrant hotel there? It's because they don't want the backlash. It's because they know the vast majority of the British public do not want it. Coming up next, firefighters have been resorting to food banks, according to the Fire Brigade Union. Tory MP Brendan Clark-Smith, who disagrees with average wage firemen using food banks, will be here. And he is going to go toe-to-toe or hose-to-hose with fireman and trade unionist Paul Embry for a good old debate. Oh, yes, that's going to kick off. Don't forget, though, send in your views at gbviews at gbnews.uk. You can just send in your views generally or ask me any question you'd like and give me a right good pummeling at the end of this show. I'll be back after the break. This is the People's Channel, so let's channel the people. We asked you, with our current asylum policy, what is the point of the border force? Ian's been on. Didn't know we had a border force. What are they meant to be doing? Well, one would assume, Ian, it's a fair question, by the way, one would assume enforcing our borders, which doesn't appear to be happening right now. I did find it absolutely amazing, though, that when some border force officers at various different airports went on strike, the service actually improved and it got more efficient. And that wasn't just because the army was waving everyone through. Anyway, Andy says, send them all to patrol Dunkirk and Calais, the camps, thank you very much, um, then they might actually achieve something. Obviously, the French don't want to do that. Well, look, this is supposed to be the point. We're supposed to have now border force officers on beaches and around the beaches in France. I don't imagine that the French gendarmes feel particularly good about that, although, to be fair, it's not the first time that we've had British boots on a French beach. Sam says, quite. All they seem to do is pick them up at the halfway point and bring them to the UK, a glorified human trafficking taxi service. I mean, it is. I mean, I wonder whether or not the human traffickers should actually be given some kind of discount, really, because they only bring them three quarters of the way and the British Border Force does the rest. Another Ian says, we've double ian says, correct, it's a complete farce, border farce, and utterly disgraceful that the borders are not correctly enforced. You can argue that we don't really have any borders, do we? Anyway, right, OK, we're moving on, people. This is a big one, this. It's a hot debate. Eh? According to the Fire Brigades Union, firefighters earning approximately £32,000 a year have been turning to food banks over the past few months. This comes after the union rejected a 5% pay offer from the government in which they branded it disgusting. Well, Tory MP Brendan Clark-Smith commented on this tweet, saying, I respect the profession, but £32,244 and using a food bank? Never heard such a ridiculous thing in my life. Well, with me to discuss this and debate it, I am very pleased to say, is the man himself, MP Brendan Clark-Smith and fireman and trade unionist Paul Embry. Sparks will fly, people. Sparks will fly. Brendan, why did you say what you said? People might say you're a bit out of touch. Do you really think that 32 and a bit grand, you shouldn't be using a food bank? Well, I think a lot of people are finding it very difficult at the moment with the cost of living, and, and we understand that and we, we get that, of course. But what I'd also say is £32,000, you know, that is, that is not a bad salary. That's more than I earned during a lot of my teaching career. 
Uh, the median salary is about 25,000 in Bassett Law, where I am, because it's well above the national average and so on. Of course, it's a lot more than a lot of staff in Parliament are paid as well. So mm-hmm. whilst I'm sure that people want a decent wage and I'm sure that uh, you know, every penny does count, I think we need to put it in context a bit. And really, nobody on 32,000 uh, should be using food banks. Now, what I would say is there will be individual cases. Uh, people who've suffered domestic abuse, people um, who have had one-off costs or tragedies or, or various yeah. other things. And I think you have to treat them on, on their individual merits. But generally, a person on £32,000 a year, Patrick, should not be using a food bank. Yeah, I mean, Paul, I'll bring you in now. Fireman and trade unionist Paul Embry. Firefighters might be good at putting out fires, but they're no good at managing their own finances, apparently. Well, it's simply not true, and I think many firefighters would find it insulting, that suggestion. Look, the the fact is, when you look at the average firefighter, after tax, national insurance, their occupational pension scheme contributions, they're taking home something like around £1,800 a month. Now, half of that immediately, roughly, on average, is wiped out through mortgage or rent payments. You've then got to factor in energy bills, which, as we know, are increasing sharply at the moment. You've then got to talk about food bills, which for the average family are something like three or four hundred pounds a month. You then talk about the standard monthly bills, such as water rates and council tax. You then talk about childcare. I mean, I I don't know if Brendan's being serious when he says that firefighters should comfortably be able to get along on this salary. And it strikes me that perhaps he hasn't grasped just how serious this cost of living crisis is for people. People are really struggling to make ends meet. And of course, it's true that there are some people on a lower wage than firefighters. Some people are having it even tougher. But that, does that mean that firefighters okay. themselves are not having it tough? Of okay. course it doesn't. And, and the, to- the Tory MPs who are making this sort of case has, have got to get in the real world. Brendan, you've got to get in the real world. Yeah, I mean, you could could point to people who are earning less and you could look at pensioners, for example. Um, And I'm I'm not interested in a race to the bottom and say I can live on less money than you can and so on. I suppose we are assuming that 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 is the sole breadwinner and there's there's not another adult in the household, but then there's been government support. Uh, My wife and I, we've used things like 30 hours free childcare and tax-free childcare, Uh, things like the energy bills, the £400 for that, uh, extra if you need it and so on. So there is that support that's there. But I think what we also have to bear in mind, for most of the country, this is... This is a decent income. Um, But now if you look on Twitter, and of course this caused quite a a Twitter storm earlier, um, one word kept coming up quite often, and that word was London. And I think you have to look at London as a a completely different case entirely. So cost of living crisis, yes, for many, but I think you also have a cost of London crisis, and that actually predates Ukraine, predates COVID. Um, You know, you could go back to saying that, you know, Boris Johnson, I think in his first five years as London mayor, um, had doubled the number of affordable homes that he can't did. They're looking at this ultra low emissions zone now that's going to target people with old bangers and so on who, who mm. can't afford a brand new electric Tesla. You can look at Labour and boroughs like Lambeth charging extra council tax to what used to be conservative mm. ones like Westminster. So I think we have to look at London in isolation. But £32,000, okay. I think, is a good salary. I'd like a lot of my constituents to be earning that sort of salary. But for oh. those who can't, then, yes, it's great we have food banks and volunteers to help out. Paul, I'm just going to throw over to something that you said a bit earlier on about the pension contributions. I mean, presumably you could opt out of the pension contributions, get that in your immediate pay packet. Should you not be doing that? Well, I mean, of course you could opt out of, um, you know, having a, having a pension scheme, being part of the pension scheme. But I don't think even the government would recommend that people opt out of their occupational pensions. This government is one of the, arguably one of the, the correct things it's done is to argue that people should um, secure their, their own futures financially. So, you know, I, I certainly don't want to see pensioner firefighters in, in you know, destitution or poverty because they haven't entered into the pension scheme. That brings its own problems financially for the country in years to come. But Look, Brendan says he doesn't want to race to the bottom, but every argument he made, more or less, was the race to the bottom. He's essentially saying, look, there are some people worse off than firefighters, including his constituents. So what are firefighters complaining about? Well, unquestionably, Mm. there are some people worse off. And it's right and proper that those people get decent wage increases as well, because look, the facts speak for themselves. Workers in this country, including firefighters, are in the grip of the tightest wage squeeze since Napoleonic times. They are being asked once again 
to take a real terms pay cut during a cost of living crisis when inflation is at something like I 9 get that. or 10%. Paul, people I'm just gonna, are really yeah. struggling to make ends meet. Right. And lecturing people about budgeting better simply isn't the answer. You've got to give people <laughs> decent me, pay but... rises, get money yeah. into people's pockets. That's how you alleviate well, people's problems. That's it. Now, that, that Paul, I take on board exactly what you're saying, but that is a fine line. I'm going to throw it back to you, Brendan, because... Paul might say lecturing people on budgeting better. I can remember when Chris Whitty used to lecture me and my family every single flipping evening, and I was sick of that. But actually, it was supposed to be government advice. Should we not have some government advice during a cost of living crisis? Are you not just giving out useful advice, Brendan, people like you and Lee Anderson? Well, yeah, we, we've just done that with energy about turning thermosats down and, and all sorts of things. But as I said before, Patrick, and, and um, you know, a lot of my constituents would be delighted to earn £32,000 a year. You know, that, is a, that is an aspiration for a lot of people. And I think with food banks, I think it is completely wrong to trivialise food banks every time there's a wage negotiation there. And I, I would challenge the FBU to actually show me these people and well, certainly outside London, who are using food banks on £32,000 a year. Where Brendan, are they? Now, Brendan, to be fair, you raise an interesting point, and this is an uncomfortable issue. And, Paul, I do have to put this to you, OK? We do hear a lot about these things just branded around X and X is going to food banks, so-and-so is going to food banks. Paul, can you actually prove that firefighters are going to food banks? Paul. See there? We've lost Paul. Have we lost Paul? I, I think it's in Oh, he's there. That Sorry, Paul. Go on, can you prove it? Crisis. Sorry, Patrick, say it again. Sorry, Paul, I lost you there for a second, mate. Can you actually prove that firefighters are going to food banks? Well, my union has reported that firefighters are. I'm perfectly happy to believe my union. I don't think my union is lying about that. And actually knowing firefighters, I've been a firefighter for 25 years, and firefighter colleagues are saying to me things now that they've never said to me before. They said to me before Christmas they were struggling to buy their kids' Christmas presents. They were struggling to pay their energy bills. They were struggling to pay their mortgages. So I'm pretty certain that what the union has reported is true. But let me put this point, if I can, to yep. Brendan. Why is it that Tory MPs always go for people at the Lower end of the scale. What have we seen recently? We've seen city bonuses surging. We've seen executive pay going up handsomely. We've seen some of our corporations registering record profits. Now, why is it that the likes of Brendan and others don't say, well, actually, during a cost of living crisis, some of that sort of stuff is All unethical. Right. And if we're going to target people, we should perhaps target some of those people before we target okay. emergency services who are struggling to make ends meet. That shows to me a pretty immoral set of priorities. All right, Paul, I'll, thank you very much for that. I'll give the final word to Brendan, let him come back, and then we're off, chaps. Go on, Brendan. OK, thanks. I don't think £32,000 a year is the bottom end of the pile. I mean, that's, that's not people on minimum wage. This is a skilled profession we're talking about here. You know, I, I could go back 20 years, the FBU were asking for about 40-odd percent, and I, th I think the, the union leader had about an 80 grand odd package there. So, I mean, there's a long history of this. Now, I don't resent anybody going for a decent wage. Don't resent negotiations, Paul. I understand how, how unions work, and I completely respect that, and I respect firefighters, but... £32,000 to visit a food bank. I think it's very much the exception okay. rather than the rule. Look, both of you, thank you very much. Done in exactly the right way and you love to see it. And I wish you both all the best. I'm sure I'll speak to you both very, very soon. That is MP Brendan Clark-Smith, Tory MP, and Fireman and Trade Unionist Paul Embry just reacting to that story as to whether or not actually, realistically, £32,000 a year, you should be going to a food bank. I'm not sure. What do you think? Maybe you're on about that kind of money. Let us know. Get in touch. GBviews at gbnews.uk. That tells you exact salary. It's a bit of a personal question, that isn't it? But you could let us know if you're on around that kind of salary. Have you been close to using a food bank? Anyway, moving on. Just what are Xi Jinping and Wang Kuning and the CCP lot playing at? Yes, that's a phrase I never thought I'd say on national television. We're going to find out next with Cindy Yu, China expert, host of the Chinese Whispers podcast and assistant editor of The Spectator. There she is. Thank you very much, Cindy. And don't forget, make sure that you send in your views, gbviews at gbnews.uk. We're talking about whether or not it's time to get tough on China. Don't go anywhere. Right, let's rattle through it, people. Under pressure from protests, the kind of which have not been seen in China since 1989, and with their economy beginning to falter under the corona restrictions, Beijing head sheds finally 
finally relented on their zero COVID policy on December the 7th. The result, after two years of extreme restrictions, has been, rather predictably, an explosion in COVID cases. But, yet again, what's a problem in China can become a problem over here. An explosion that, of course, has frightened several Western countries, including the UK, into introducing entry restrictions for the first time. Here to discuss the situation in China and the Western reaction to it is China expert and host of The Spectator's excellent Chinese Whispers podcast. It's Cindy Yu. Cindy, thank you very, very much. Now, China has spoken about essentially retaliations if we dare to restrict Chinese people from coming into the UK. What do they mean? Well, I'm not sure there are there is much retaliation to be done, considering China requires inbound travellers themselves to have a negative test. So if I were to go to China, as I'm hoping to do this year, then I will have to take a negative, take a test and hope for it to be negative. Otherwise, I won't be let in. So it is essentially equivalent to what they have. You can question whether or not this restriction matters either in either direction, considering how um, ep how endemic the pandemic already is. Uh, but at the same time, you know, th it is essentially equivalent. I guess the only thing that they could do more that other countries have done is to isolate uh, positive cases. So uh, there's talk of that in Italy, for example, and that would be a kind of retaliation. But other than that, as I say, negative tests are required to enter China mm. right now. Do you think at the moment we're hearing increasing whispers of restrictions, of mask wearing, of all of this stuff as shock horror winter comes and people get the sniffles, OK? Do you think China actually provides the best example of why a full throttle zero COVID policy just doesn't work? Well, it's really hard to say. I, I think I think under the Delta variant, where it was much less infectious and much more serious to get it, um, it actually did make sense. And we saw that in the first two years of the pandemic, where... China did manage to keep cases down. You might not believe its official numbers, but it, I mean, what we're seeing now is that they, it can't hide a massive wave when a massive wave comes because people like me, other journalists, have contacts, have family, have friends in China. So anecdotally, we know something's happening. But that didn't happen in the first two years. So zero COVID did work at the time. Omicron changed everything, in my opinion. Um, this much more infectious, but m ultimately more mild variant of the disease. Mm. And over the last year, we've seen various attempts to keep that under under wraps. Shanghai be lockdown being one of the fiercest lockdowns. And that just didn't work for this kind of <laughs> variant. So, But at the same time, I'm not sure that this kind of system of opening up the, mm. the, the, the timeline that we're talking about, where within a month you go from zero COVID to completely yeah. opening up, is also working either. Now, we are seeing pictures of the Wuhan Institute of Virology there, where, in my opinion, and it is just my opinion, I think the coronavirus first started, they weren't particularly proactive in telling people exactly about it then. Cindy, I think people have a concern, don't they, that if a new variant was detected in China now and it was more deadly, they probably wouldn't tell the world about it and might let it spread. Sure. I mean, perhaps, look, I, I, first me, of all, I have to say that I'm not an epidemiologist, um, but in my understanding, there is an international database where tests are um, sequenced and you put up uh, you put up your test results to this database and international scientists can discover new variants. And you can question how many cases are being tested and put in that database, considering not many people are getting tested in China at all. Uh, but I'm not sure a cover up will be particularly easy, as I think that the Chinese government just has no idea, basically. But also... You know, I, I'm a believer in living with COVID. We're now in 2023. Mm. It's time that we lived with this virus. So if there's a new variant, we should be looking at new ways to vaccinate people, to boost the most vulnerable. But people mm. like me and you, you know, we shouldn't be yeah. concerned about new variants. No. Otherwise, no, exactly. End. And I don't want to live in under any, any more restrictions whatsoever. I don't think anyone should have to. We've done conceivably everything that we possibly can do about this particular thing now. Not only have we got a vaccine and it's freely available to anyone and as many of them as they want, you can get jabbed up to your eyeballs if you so please. We've knackered our economy. We've ruined a load of children's education. We've created a massive mental health crisis on top of what was already a mental health crisis. People with addiction issues have had those addiction issues get a lot worse. I mean, I know alcoholics and drug addicts, for example, suffered hugely by virtue of being locked down. Several people were locked down with their domestic abusers, for goodness sake. We've absolutely brought this country, in many respects, to its knees. A lot of the time was to protect our NHS. And our NHS has to be there to serve us, in my opinion, and not the other way round. And just finally, Cindy, closer to home, on that point, any more restrictions? Do you think the British public would just resist en masse? 
Yes, well, I hope so. <laughs> I mean, in some ways, I feel this kind of negative, requiring a negative test from Chinese visitors mm. is already cutting off our nose. Um, because why are we putting in more restrictions at all? You know, the Chinese may require a negative test, but that doesn't mean that we should. Um, and in order to live with COVID, we have to be okay with the idea of new variants and believing in our vaccines if that is what you chose to do um and you know bear in mind that there's new variants of the flu every single year and the flu jab gets updated with the new variants every single year to protect the most vulnerable mm. but other people just don't have to think about it in the same way so i, I do feel like we made yeah. a political choice rather than a scientific choice by requiring yeah. negative tests for travelers from china I will never forget the fear. I was sat there next to my grandma. I was around at my grandma's house one day. It was just her and I, and Chris Whitty pops up, and Patrick Valance, and whoever else, and they were pumping out predictions, predictions, predictions. Now, it's all very well and good, but they were presented as fact. They could have done more. They could have done more to say that these might be way off the mark. I don't care what anyone says. I was there. I watched it live with my elderly grandmother, and we were looking at that TV screen, and it certainly was at least presented as this being more likely than not, and it terrified people and that I think was wrong. Cindy, thank you very much. Cindy, you there, who is The Spectator's excellent Chinese Whispers podcast guru and of course as well uh, has a lot of family in China so can give us a first-hand account of what's been going on over there. Coming up, we'll be talking to, get this, transgender Catholic school teacher George White about how he plans to bridge the gap between the LGBTQ community and the church. Good stuff. I'm looking forward to this actually. Lots to learn and Pummel Patrick, yes, that's right. I haven't had enough pummeling from you. It's just around the corner. I wonder how you'll pummel me tonight. Uh, I cry myself to sleep. GB Views at GBNews.uk. Welcome back. Now, we cover a lot of trans stories on this show. We believe in personal freedoms, but also in biological truths. And this week, we saw the first non-binary priest to be ordained by the Church of England. We've noticed it's becoming a bit of a theme, the LGBT community and religion butting heads with each other. Remember when a Cambridge dean insinuated that Jesus might have been transgender? Or a recent exclusive where we interviewed a father who discovered that a C of E school was showing his eight-year-old child transgender educational books. If you don't remember, take a look at the video that they were being shown. Hello, everyone. My name is Nana CC. JJ is neither a boy nor a girl. When you were born, you couldn't tell people who you were or how you felt. They looked at you and made a guess. Maybe they got it right. Maybe they got it wrong. What a baby's body looks like when they're born can be a clue to what the baby's gender will be, but not always. I know you think I'm a boy, but really, I feel like a girl. Oops. Ruthie was a girl all along. They just didn't know it at first. Hmm. Okay. The question is, does LGBTQ ideology and religious values align? Someone who aims to bridge the gap between the LGBT community and religion is my next guest, transgender Catholic school teacher, George White. George, thank you very much. First things first, is it all right if you just tell our viewers and our listeners a little bit about your story? Uh, sure. Hi, my name is George. I am a transgender man, so I was born female. Uh, I now identify as male. I take um, testosterone. I've had chest surgery. Uh, I'm legally recognised as female still, uh, but my name uh, has been changed to Mr George White. Uh, I became Catholic at the age of 16 at my secondary school, uh, where I now teach, uh, and I transitioned. I started the process of transitioning about four years ago. Well, thank you very much for outlining all of that. Before I just talk a little bit about bridging the gap between religion and, and transgenderism, etc., I'm keen to get your views on why you think, or if you think, that children should be taught about transgenderism. Do you not think it might be a bit confusing? <sighs> I think a lot of things that we teach children about can be seen as confusing and I certainly wouldn't advocate for the resource that we've just seen mm. um, but I do think that we can talk about these things in a sensible and mature way in the mm. same way we talk about people of other faiths or other things like that um, there are going to be lots of things that might sway someone's mind as a young person that could be for a lengthy period of time it could be for the rest of their life it may just be a phase but as educators that's not our job to decide. 
Yeah, and I think that's a really fascinating point of view, actually, to have, and I think one that a lot of people will agree with, because there is a concern, especially when we've looked at some of the stuff that's been going on up in Scotland, for example, about whether or not decisions that are made by children, and they are children, at a particular moment in time, during a very confusing period of their lives, can go on to have permanent consequences, that some of them may go on to regret. And do you think that maybe quite a few people will go on to regret? I know, obviously, you, you don't, of course, but do you think some people might? There is always a chance that people might. The numbers are uh, exceptionally low of people that, that detransition, I think, is the word that's used. Hmm. Um, there is some misunderstanding of the way in which the system works. So I've been on an a NHS waiting list since November 2017. I had my first appointment in February 2022. That would have meant that I wouldn't have had access to surgery or hormones had I not had the funds to do that. Mm. So people are not being thrown into life-changing decisions immediately. And I still think there needs to be a service for people to explore their feelings mm. of gender identity, whether they might be short-term or long-term, yeah. is something for them to discuss in that process. I think some people have a concern, don't they? So whether or not their child is actively demonstrating or thinking a certain way, in which case that's, you could argue, natural, right? Or whether or not that thought is being planted into the child's head by someone who may or may not be qualified in order to, to put that there. But just more specifically in terms of yourself and, and where you're at as well, my understanding is you want to try to bridge a gap between LGBT and the church. Just talk to me about that, because some people would be saying that there's not really any need to bridge a gap. Okay, sure. Um, I think things are changing and I think that the gap is getting smaller. But I work in a school where I work with people that might be religious, that might be LGBT, but mm. often feel that those things perhaps can't go together. And one of the ways in which the media often kind of presents these things is to say that you can only be one or the other. Mm. And for someone like me, being trans and being Catholic are two very, very important facets of my identity. Mm. What we have seen is a change in the Catholic Church uh, within the papacy of Pope Francis, really, that there's an acknowledgement of LGBT people and what they are going through. Church teaching hasn't changed, and that's not the intention of what I'm trying to do either. Mm. But what I do feel is that we must listen to the other. If we're going to love I've our just... neighbour... I'm just sorry to interrupt, it's just we are a bit pressed time and I want to ask you one more question, if that's all right, because I understand you obviously transitioned from uh, being female into, into male and there's a lot of hoo-ha at the moment about people going the other way around and potentially that being either more intrusive to things like elite level women's sport, right, or just maybe public safety and changing rooms, etc. Can I ask how you feel about that? And I know we're a bit pressed with time, it's a massive question, but how do you feel about that? Do you think that people transitioning from manhood into womanhood frankly, tends, might pose a bit more of a threat. I can understand what people are saying, and I think mm. that there's a there's a, a very deeper issue of, of what we're we're assuming trans women are doing because they have lived as men. Mm. Um, I think what we need to be looking at is what are men doing. The Equality Act and the changes to the gender recognition reform do not change the fact that a man could still enter a woman's bathroom mm. uh, in accordance with the Equality Act, or in accordance, you know, if, if a man chooses to identify okay. as female, that person can go into a women's bathroom. That is a problem with men, not with trans women. Uh, most of the time, we can see that. OK, look, George, thank you very much. I've enjoyed this discussion. I'm sorry we're a bit pressed for time, because I could talk to you all evening, actually, and would find it fascinating. George White there, who is transgender Catholic school teacher, looking to bridge the gap between religion and the LGBTQ plus community. What do you make of that, ladies and gentlemen? There's rather a lot to unpack there, isn't there? Right, I think, very quickly, very quickly, it's time to give me a right good pummeling. There you go. Uh, have you had your eyebrows done? They look beautiful. No, uh, uh, I've not actually. That's from Sharon, thank you very much. But Sharon, if you want to see my eyebrows, you can, I suppose. Janine says, who is your... Fa <laughs> Here we go. Who is your favourite GB News presenter other than Mark Stein? Who's on over there at the minute? Who's on? Mark Come Dolan. on, Christie's! Mark Dolan's my favourite GB News presenter other than myself and Mr Mark Stein. And yes, OK, here he is, here he is, bring him on. Oh, my favourite GB News, what a coincidence. Mark, what's on the show? No pressure at all. Well, listen, you've always been my favourite, Patrick. 
Could facing down the unions be Rishi Sunak's mm. Thatcher moment? Could it be his Falklands moment? Also, is the vegan diet a con? And in my big opinion monologue, the government wants us to wear these again. Oh. My reaction in a couple of minutes. I know what's coming. I know what's coming. There we are. Well, the wonderful Mark Dolan will be here covering for Dan Watson this evening. There we go. Make sure you stay tuned as the great Mark Stein says. By the way, Mark's on the mend. I want to just inform you all of all this. I know a load of you ask. Mark Stein is getting better. He'll be back soon. It's been an honour and a privilege to fill in for him. I'll be back again tomorrow night, by the way. But yes, don't worry. He'll be back soon. As Mark Stein says, make sure you wonderful people stay safe, stay free.